Oh no, I have a cat and dog fight. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> no I can't. Fighting. I'm in the dark. Okay, we are live today. Welcome to AI Arthritis Voices 360. This is the official talk show for the International Foundation for Autoimmune and Autoinflammatory Arthritis, or AI Arthritis for short. We are moving from our former acronym, which we would say IFAA, to AI Arthritis. So not a name change, just an acronym change. <laughs> So uh, we are happy to be doing our show for the first time this week live in honor of our auto ball. So uh, what is our auto ball? Well, um, as an organization, we decided for the first time ever, we are going off offline to the public to say hello and introduce ourselves. And then COVID happened and we're back here. <laughs> so we are now online and part of the auto ball or our annual gala was to honor the 450 million people around the world who are affected by our diseases, but also to teach the teach more people about who we are, what we do. We're here so that we can find more people to help and then also to raise funds to get us through till 2021. So we're taking our we're taking our our live shows that we were going to do anyway while we were at the auto ball here. So I'm not alone. If you're watching, you will see that I have two lovely people here with me right now. Um, my name is Tiffany. I am the CEO of AI arthritis and also a person living with AI arthritis diseases, primarily non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. <clears throat> and I've got my co-host, patient co-host, as we always have here, Deb Constein. Hi, Deb. Hey there, guys. How are you? I am good. I am good. Good. Um, yeah. yeah, I've um I have a patient that's um had RA since I was 13 years old. So um and lots of other comorbidities added on to that. So yeah, happy to be here. So so you're you're like the rest of us, just a little bit <laughs> added on at a time. And then exactly. we have we have a friend here too who's also a colleague, and we're so excited to to have her here. We have we have Orly Nash Nashma. Hi, did I mess it up? Nashma. Najma. No, Najma. I like how she says it better. Najma. So I have Orly <laughs> Najma. It just sounds so much more like exotic. <laughs> who is a who, who is a, a research fellow at uh, Glasgow University and also somebody that we have worked with within our organization um, at Omaract, which is outcome measures uh, in rheumatology. And also we saw Ora Lee presenting last uh, last year in 2019 at the ULAR uh, European League Against Rheumatism conference on e-health and we've invited her back here today but hi Ora Lee how are you hi hi everyone I'm doing great I'm very excited to be here with you today we're excited to have you tell us a little bit tell everybody a little bit about you Deb and I already know but but they may not so why don't you <laughs> why don't you tell us a little bit yeah, so I'm originally from France. I'm a rheumatologist. I've been working there and I recently moved to Glasgow uh, where I'm now, I'm now doing um, research as well as working at, at the hospital as a physician. Great. Well, um, we're glad that you're here. We're very excited um, to have you for this conversation. So what are we talking about? We mentioned eHealth. Um, and so health online, if you will. And uh, there's a couple of reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have Orly here. Well, first of all, to give you a background, if you're not familiar with the show, it follows our mission as an organization to have patients, people living with AI arthritis diseases at the table as equals with other stakeholders so that we can have conversations that Together, we can solve problems that impact education, advocacy, and research. So often, our shows will be based on those conversations so that you can sort of be a fly on the wall. You can listen in and, and hear the conversations and then join in and add your comments, usually after the show. We're live, so you can add those comments uh, right in the comment box if you're, if you're here with us. And while we may not be able to interact with you on a live basis, we will follow up and, and respond to your comments 
after the fact. So e-health, what a topic today <laughs> in, in today's, in today's world, right? And Orly COVID and, world. <laughs> yeah. The, the world now known as COVID <laughs> time of COVID-19. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Deb and I went to the ULAR Congress, the conference in um, Madrid, Spain in 2019. And this episode is a build, uh, is building on one that Deb and I did yesterday. So on our Facebook page, you will also see one uh, labeled conferences and please go and check that out. And that's why I have my backdrop is a trade show <laughs> so <laughs> with cars. Um, but uh, that the reason why it's, we talked a lot about the reason why conferences are so important. But the point with it here is that in order for us to understand and learn the cutting edge information that's being shared at these conferences, like the session that Aura Lee was one of the leaders on one of the panelists is that we need to be able to to translate this new information into the projects that we're doing. So that's one of the reasons. And then there's other scientific sessions just so that we can understand for our own diseases and relay them back to our community so you can learn with us. But in this case, it really was uh, based on us taking the information knowing that we as an organization need to include all voices at the table. And that means that we have to do some type of E, <laughs> e, e involvement so, so that we can reach all people. So since access to care and access to treatments and, 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 and improving our overall quality of life is important to us, we wanted to learn what everybody was, was working on to increase e-health and access to care. And so that's why we attended it. And now we're even more excited to sort of revisit what we learned while we were there and how this is evolving now that we are thrust into e-health. <laughs> when, when we were at the conference, it was, here's what's happening. Here's what we're, we're creating. And now here we are. Uh, so in, that, in, in saying that, I first want to ask Deb um, for a little bit of an overview of, I mean, short overview of some of the things that we learned while we were there. Sure. Um, um, when Orly was speaking, um, I mean, she could actually address some of this stuff herself, but um, something that just jumped out at me, because um, I did a, I looked back at some of the slides that I captured and um, it said that time spent per day on mobile phones has increased at that time 575% in three years. That is, again, shocking, but not shocking. Again, our, our cell phones are part of, I mean, I've got mine sitting right here. So um, it's part of, yeah, it's, it's part of what everyday life is. Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but the, the thing that we were learning about was um, just how it was related to, and what your thoughts were of how it would relate to patients as well as to physicians and the benefits and the outcomes related to that. Um, and some of the apps that, um, I even started a real-time conversation as we were sitting in your, um, con in that session um, that I was asking people that, um, hey, some of you guys use healthcare apps for your um, your diseases. Which ones are your favorites? And I was asked, they were kind of telling me which ones it were. And then um, people were coming back and I was asking them, okay, well, what do you like about that one? And um, what is it about that one? And we had ones, um, Judith in, um, I remember in um, Australia, she was commenting on one in particular because um, hers was related to... Um, mood and weather changes she was able to track on her app too, which was different than some of the other ones that um, people in the United States actually use. Um, but, you know, I, that's a really short little brief snippet of some of the stuff that we actually were learning and the number of um, healthcare apps that were actually being created every day and how many actually make it to market. And um, it was just, you know, mind blowing to us, you know, and again, so 
impactful. And again, here we are, we're living in the time where we're, you know, using those type of apps and sharing our, the feedback with our doctors and things like that from what we use. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So where would you like to go from there, Tiff? Well, I want to thank you for that overview. I also, I want to add before we start um, diving into this conversation with Ora Lee is one of the things that I took away and again, this is as it relates to the work we do at AI Arthritis, was the, I, the, the need to reach rural people, yeah. people who uh, may not have access to care and rheumatology. There was a lot of um, discussion regarding um, using apps or using portals or using, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just trying to, to understand and create different programs that could reach all voices, all people, uh, so that we can increase quality of life. And that really is the backbone of us at our organization, yeah. how many we need to reach more voices. And while we do want to get out there in the public, we know that in some, we can't reach out in the public to all people, which is why we've been online this whole time until, <laughs> until we try to venture out now. Um, so Orly, I would like uh, to turn it over to you uh, as person who was on that panel and just kind of give us an overview of um, where the thoughts were at that time, what was in the, what were in the plans, and then we can move into how that sort of has evolved into, wow, now we're here. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, if you could do that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, definitely. So um, um, very, we, we came from, really this project this whole project came from a very basic um observation we just realized that there were so many health apps over uh, everywhere in all um phone um like apple store android everywhere that you could easily download and just start using uh, but we we found that that none of them were actually uh providing lots of information on how they were developed on um you know how they could be useful there was not even a lot of literature out there by that time mm -hmm. uh, mentioning how um, they could really help in um clinical setting and in the daily life um so we decided to explore th this a bit further um, and very interestingly, we realized that, first of all, the literature was at that time, again, because there's been plenty of publication in between, but back then, the literature was kind of poor in this area, uh, at least in rheumatology, because mm -hmm. in some other, um, you know, in some other uh, settings, like endocrinology especially with diabetes or cardiology with hypertension there were pretty much um, lots of stuff out there but for rheumatology nothing really not much so we came from that we studied literature but we realized by studying what was published that the voice of the patients were not really heard um, and they were not really asked and they were not really um, you know, consulted when it was um, about developing the apps. Uh, and, and, and so we really wanted to hear what people living with RMDs uh, were thinking of such apps and if they were using them. So we did a survey um, that we um, actually sent over uh, several countries. And you actually, uh, Tiffany, helped us quite a lot diffusing it in the US. <laughs> we got a lot of answers from the US. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, we, we, we actually realized that um, half of our panel of respondents actually knew about these apps and were eventually uses them, using them. However, most of them were not finding them useful. So we were very interested in knowing why. Mm -hmm. and, and this was actually in line with what we found from the literature that the development phase did not involve the patients um, often enough. So okay. it can be like very useful. So based on all of this, we back with Euler 
decided to do um, a recommendation on how apps should be you know, developed and how they can be implemented in order to be useful, but also in order to ensure safety of the patient and um, security of the data, because security of data is something that mm -hmm. is really, really important in the, he the e health setting. And there's, there are regulation out there, but regulation kind of vary across the countries as well. So mm. it's quite a bit um, you know, of a challenge. Um, so this is where we were back then, I think, if I, can, <laughs> if I summarize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. And some of the things that uh, we had pointed out in, in, in this that we thought was really interesting is there were some benefits mentioned uh, for patients and benefits for the medical professional as well as mm -hmm. in, in using apps. It was specifically for the, the Revital app. I know there was a case study that, that um, was talked about. Um, but one of the things that was brought out on the benefits for patients in using these would be the therapy approaches that could be tailored to the personal Ill, the personal disease course and better therapy report uh, uh, results and higher quality of life, which that's important. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I'm just curious, and I, I don't, don't mean to put you on the spot, but this is a conversation. So you know, or that things come up. Um, what has there been any further exploration into the benefits for the patients and in how uh, apps or e-health has um because of the, the, I guess, the environment today with COVID-19. Um, some of the, because I know we're going to talk to a rheumatologist tomorrow. Deb and I are coming back to continue this conversation to see mm -hmm. what's going on in the doctor's office is, re, you know, related to COVID and, and e-health. But, you know, these benefits that were observed, I guess we should say in 2019, could, how do you feel orally that those will be implemented now in the time of COVID? I mean, is it still something that is foreseen as, I guess, doable? Or are there adjustments that you and your team and people working on e-health uh, predict might not be, I, I might not be as beneficial as maybe once thought? Or how do we adjust, I guess, is, is the question I'm asking. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that question makes a lot of sense, especially at the moment, because obviously, if we look back in 2019 and think of, of some applications of e-health, where, for example, what have been described is if someone, some patient can put into the, the app how he's feeling, if there is any symptoms, um, you know, and by doing some analysis, some prediction of flares, can be done. And so this could be like alerting the physician and they can meet earlier or to the contrary, if the patient is feeling very well and has been for the past months, for example, maybe they don't have to come into the clinic to be seen if they're doing super well and they can be seen at a later stage, for example, that these kind of things of adjustments of who needs to be seen more urgently and who needs to be seen maybe mm -hmm. later um, mm -hmm. were something we were talking a lot about at that time. Um, I would say that it's not really in the COVID era, uh, <laughs> something that, you know, that seems to be so important because at the moment we're trying to, you know, limit as much as we can um, the appointments, like the real appointment. So something that would definitely need to be, um, you know, put in first position for research at the moment would be how can we remotely be as efficient as we were um, in 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 face to face um, you know appointments, especially as rheumatology is a discipline where we actually need to touch. Mm -hmm. Like we really need to do a physical yeah. examination. We really need to touch the patient. Some specialties, it's a bit different. But for us, so this is something I, I think that that is the actual challenge. And the other actual challenge is, um, and I know that um, uh, the, the, the ACR has actually been working on some clinical vignettes 
that mm -hmm. can say that can help the physician decide uh, what situation they should still bring the patient in oh. like what would be the situation where they have to see them and what other situation uh, that can be dealt with remotely so i think these these are the kind of things at the moment that uh, really research should be focusing on in terms of e-health I think you're right because um, I have been reading, I've been getting updates. Again, um, I'm a, um, a, a member of the ACR as well, and um, they have been talking about figuring out the guidelines for, you know, the e-health. And, um, you know, from your perspective, Orly, um, I know that they've talked about, because I mean, I've actually experienced several telehealth um, appointments already, and they are all by the telephone. Now, have you been doing video conferencing? Because I think you get more information um, from the patient. I mean, again, you can physically see things that are reddened or, you know, swollen and things like that by video. But is your experience more phone or video? So we are at the moment implementing the video. So we've okay. been doing mostly phone by now, but we've been, what we've been doing is that we've been collecting um, and, and, and noting down every patient that would need to be seen uh, using a video and we're implementing that at the moment. So we'll okay. have definitely more information on that in like a couple of, of, of weeks, I guess. Yeah, like it's, sure. It's, it's coming. <laughs> It's definitely like so important because you really need to see if, mm -hmm. if it's swollen or I mean obviously phone is is the first way of getting information but ultimately you want to see that's what mm -hmm. we used to we used to see we yeah. used to touch yes <laughs> so yeah that makes a lot of sense um, one of the things that, I, well, first of all, I was going to ask when you said about the ACR or American College of Rheumatology that they were working on these vignettes. I, I was instantly, I want to see them, but I know Deb has has um, access, mm -hmm. and so I'm going to be following up yes, because I, and, and I also am curious if I, I'm curious if, how they're developing them. I'm guessing there aren't patients involved, but. I would mm -hmm. hope there would be because <laughs> it just seems that yeah. if you're developing what's important for um, being seen, it might be beneficial to also know what the patient thinks is important to be seen. But um, yeah, we'll do our own little research on that and see <laughs> uh -huh. if our ideals uh, match what, what, what they're saying. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that anything has actually been published yet. Um, I know that they've been hinting at it. Um, I, I just, I, I ha personally haven't seen anything published. Um, have you, Orly? Yeah, it's, uh, we've been uh, the, um, discussing this uh, in Twitter, actually, recently. Okay. I found you the, the actual tweet with the link. To oh, the tweet, so you can yeah, that'd be a, great. I'll be, I'll be doing that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that would be great. So you mm -hmm. mentioned, so we mentioned, so that's what the ACR is doing. And I'm just curious, going back to apps, um, Orly, are there any recommendations delivered like through ULAR uh, to, in to ensure any quality of these apps or any e-health? Yes, absolutely. So this is um, actually, ultimately, that was the goal of um, everything we've been doing back in the days in 2018 and 19 about this and we have now published these guidelines um yeah they've been published i think end of 2019 um so yeah i i would be more than happy to share with you um that was out of their 10 guidelines i'm not gonna read them all no uh, that's fine I'm gonna, I'm gonna bore everyone <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they are very good. So that we, we, we decided that we were going to focus on some different domains. So obviously safety uh, was for us like the mm -hmm. most important domain, safety, security, um, um, how data should be dealt with. I mean, we're not giving any IT recommendation, but we, we just mentioned that frameworks should really be in place to ensure that that data uh, are actually um, you know anonymized, not used for any other purpose. Um, you know, we're also talking about the content 
how it is important that the content should be um, accurate, should be scientifically validated, um, because obviously we've seen during our search, we've seen lots of apps with content that were not really scientific. And this mm -hmm. can be uh, actually uh, damageable to people because, you know, it's not validated. It, it's not coming from any scientific uh, source. Um, and we've also been um, doing uh, in our recommendation, emphasizing that the development should actually involve every stakeholder, but especially patients and at every mm -hmm. stage of the development. So this, these are some of the things we've been um, actually recommending. Okay. I love Thank that you guys have the patients involved. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think that, but that's because these apps are, are ultimately made to improve patient quality of life or at right. least should be. So how can you improve someone's quality of life if you don't know what they want or what they need? That, right. you know, that's, that was exactly what the needs and wants are exactly. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, we talked, so we talked a little bit about the benefits and how we are we, what we see as perceived benefits in, in moving forward. Uh, what are the main barriers towards implement the implementation of these apps? That's, that's really um, something that I'm glad we can discuss this because actually um, that's a question that comes uh, like very often and it's, it's the right question to ask. I mean, because obviously if, if we don't know if it's going to be helpful, why would we use them? You mm -hmm. see that? So I think that uh, there are actually two real main things that needs to be taken into account when talking about mobile health apps. Like, um, first of all, um, to date, um, if at least to my knowledge, there has not been lots of publication actually assessing if the app would be useful so we need some trials using apps um, and, and the outcomes can be very different. The outcomes can be identifying what patient needs to be seen urgently. The outcome can be, um, um, for example, pre predicting um, a flare based on the past month's uh, data, especially as, and there have been actually some work done on trying to predict if patients were going to flare based on their um, steps. Oh, uh, they, okay. Um, okay. So these kind of things. And, and another thing that would be very useful would be actually to um, analyze um, lots of data uh, using artificial intelligence and all that kind of new technologies mm -hmm. to see if um, there could be some trajectories mm. over years, you know, where you can tell, well, um, this, this trajectory is a trajectory where the treatments need to be escalated pretty fast because they won't respond to DMARS or, you know, that kind of thing. There mm -hmm. could be lots and lots of things to be done. But the, uh, the, the, the first thing that needs to be done is, first of all, to show that it's easy to, do, it's easy to use. It's not too time consuming because um, when we asked the patients, a lot of them were saying that it was very time consuming to enter all the data. And they were not sure where the data were going and if anyone was seeing mm -hmm. the data. And why would you spend an hour entering data if you don't see, know if anyone's going to ever see them? And, you know, <laughs> so th that's... So that, that's our few things. So feasibility, ease of use um, are very important. Making sure that there's going to be an outcome out of there, an impact of you entering data. So this, for now, I see should be part of trials. Um, I, I don't see it uh, being implemented in daily practice tomorrow, but I think there's plenty of things we can do to you know, build a path towards the implementation for all these purposes. Um, That's great. Yeah. That's interesting because um, I've been attending a few uh, online web. Well, of course, they're online webinars <laughs> <laughs> at this point, right? <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah. Of course they are. But I've been attending several webinars 
uh, over the last month or so, specifically on clinical trial research and how all of the clinical trials now, they're scrambling. I mean, we're yeah. t- from everything from non-pharmacologic to pharmacologic. It's, it's, you know, how do we continue our trials when we can't have the patients come in? And so there's a lot of talk of how do we implement e-health? And I mean, I know that, uh, I mean, creating an app takes, <laughs> takes some time, you know, it's not like we could just jump in a week. Um, you know, I, I don't know. They, they've talked about looking into existing apps and, but the, the point is, is that we're here now. And and looking into what's been done and what could be translated, which I think is really interesting because what started as access to care, it's exciting to think that that work could be built upon for other, you know, other areas in the research continuum and mm-hmm. in, in, in translated, uh, I think is really interesting. Something I, I wanted to throw over to Deb because you were talking earlier about how, well, and I remember this, I was, I wish I had taken a picture. That would have been kind of cool to show Orly. But when we were watching you speak, Orly, yeah. and Deb is sitting there posting about it on social media, asking questions in relationship. And you're probably thinking, I wish you had, like, I could see all of it because yeah. you're like live responses. Um, but one of the questions I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you asked Deb was, existing apps, what people like, what they maybe don't like. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up is because I, in my experience, and, and again, we all, we like to have as many voices at the table because I'm just one person and, mm-hmm. and I'm just basing it off of myself and what I've spoken to with some other people. And it's clearly not all people. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little older and you know, this might be diff- this might be different if we're talking about somebody who's 20 or 18. I don't know, because you know, the use of apps is a little different it, as it may be different for somebody 60 or 70. Um, but mm-hmm. in my experience, it seems that patients get bored really quick with apps. Um, that it's yeah. hard to keep going. The interest is there. Yeah. The interest is there and then it's gone. Cause it's like, okay, I I'm tired of answering the same questions. Um, cause they'll keep posing the same questions like once a week or something like that. Yeah. And you'll get reminders, you know, fill in your data of how you're feeling today and things like that. Yeah. Um, did you, I mean, cause I actually have the actual question that I, that sure, I yeah, did go pose. Ahead. Yeah. Um, I posed, um, did you know that um, there are 200 health mobile apps created every day. For rheumatology, these apps don't exist. Um, what mobile health app do you find most effective? So that was the question that I posed to a lot of folks. And I got like pages, I was typing all the responses out of just, you know, what, what meant the most to everybody. Um, the one that came up here in the United States was Vectra. Vectra was a, um, a um, one that was pointed out several times for different pieces of why it was important. And, and may well I, as- may I, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, go just, ahead. So Vectra, can, do you, can we tell people a little bit, just, I mean, not um, a, an ad in any way, but it is to monitor rheumatoid arthritis, correct? The disease activity? Vectra? Yes, there's different, yeah, you have, I mean, Vectra is, um, a blood test that you actually have done. Are you aware of this, Orly? Ve- no, have you heard of Vectra? Okay, it is a pharma pharma um, pharma based. Um, I forget which pharma based. Um, do you remember? Oh, it doesn't matter. We don't want to. We yeah. don't want to plug okay. them anyway. They don't fund right. us. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, but it is a blood test Get that honest. actually shows. Yeah, it shows um, inflammatory markers in different pieces, and there's probably like twenty there's numbers that they pose and there's a graph that they give you to compare to, but, um, apparently you're able to, um, you managing their diseases as far as like the up and coming apps. And I asked what, what is it that you love about it? And people were saying that they track where I'm hurting and how bad it is. It also allows you to document, um, fatigue. Um, as something that, and then when she goes to her doctor, she opens up the app and it gives a nice graph that indicates how she's doing like over a span of time. 
So that was something that Vectra did. And um, arthritis power was another one that was mentioned as well, that Creaky Joints, um, our Shout friends. Shout out. Yeah, our friends at Love Creaky Joints. Creaky Joints and Glo- yeah. Global Healthy Living Foundation say, it, what, um, it, which is Creaky Joints is is derived a, as part of the, the umbrella organization. Uh, right. The foundation. Right. And um, that arthritis power does... Um, I'm pretty, I, I actually occasionally do pop in there. I, again, don't do it as often as I probably should. Um, it talks about changes in your medication. So it does ask you to input all that data. And I was, um, I actually had a different app that I was able to use my cell phone and scan the front of the bottle. And um, it would take everything and input it into the app itself. So you didn't have to write, you know, type out all of the data. Um, And I actually shared that with them because I said, you know, that actually, I have like 25 medications and that is incredibly time consuming. And I lost interest halfway through and had to finish it up another time because I was done typing, my hands hurt. So I was done. but yeah, you know, those were the uh, major ones. And then Judith, um, she had one that was called in Australia, the Catch My Pain, which I've never heard of. But um, you document your mood, your weather changes. Um, you are able to document um, areas of the body that actually hurt and how you have to describe the um, pain. And she said, whether you use um, stabbing or throbbing or dull pain, you use those type of words to, um, you know, describe your pain. And she said, you can set reminders and chat in a forum about different kinds of things. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, Again, it was a wealth of information, you know, in a very quick amount of time that I was, you know, capturing as we're sitting into the, you know, meeting and listening to all the information. So it was, it was a really interesting, um, inf- informational to it. Cause we're like, Hey, what if we post it to our community right now? <laughs> right. And I, what I think is so, what I, and again, I, I say it every time, look, I'm proof, lots yeah. of notes. I take yeah. lots of notes throughout these so they can circle back and I don't miss any information. A couple points to what you just said, Deb, first of all, what you literally just said was how yeah. we incorporated the patient voice in real time. We brought the patient voice to the table, literally, as we were yes. sitting at a panel. And that's yes. a very good example of what we do as an organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, but second, interestingly, uh, you know, I was kind of connecting the dots on what you were saying were the benefits or the things that, what, knowing that a barrier is participation and mm-hmm. adherence to mm-hmm. doing these apps, was the one factor that kept people in that, that listed as their favorites or the ones that they use most, there was a direct benefit to their health. There was a direct benefit. Right. They could print something out. They could bring it to the doctor. They and actually interact. open it up and yeah, open their phone and, in real time and show them a graph. And, and right. It was a resource mm-hmm. for yes. them yep. at, at the end. And that also, I, I, I wrote down that they, they liked that the domains uh, that the end, but meaning um, the outcomes, the things that patients want measured, fatigue was in there. So it, mm-hmm. they were very, they, they seemed to be more interested in the ones that uh, were outcomes that were most important to them. Mm-hmm. So I think those are two really important takeaways, especially for you, Arlie, as somebody who develops these. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that's something that might help with the barrier of adherence, right? The yeah. other thing too, um, in one that Judith said, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but um, she said you could actually set reminders, which um, that actually is huge. If you could actually set those kind of reminders. Um, I know with arthritis power, they just send you um, an email that says it's time to hop back into arthritis power. Um, and you, it's, I will say that I, um, even over the years, Arthritis Power is, imp- is a great app, but I also f- find it not as intuitive. And I've shared that with them. It's not mm-hmm. easy to navigate the actual app itself. Um, I find that I have a hard time figuring where I go to next. Oh, I mean, the actual questions can propagate, but if you're looking for information and you want to see what the history of something looks like, that's harder to find. 
-hmm. and actually pull out from the app. So um, yeah, just um, again, my own two cents on that. But, you know, some of these other ones, I mean, boy, if you can actually open up an app and show them in real time, how you've been doing over the last month yeah. and where the pipes, um, peaks and valleys are, you know, that's interesting. Thank you for for um, for for the for for mentioning all of those Deb, because yeah. it's important to know yeah. what patients and and I and I would just like to throw it out there if any if any for anyone who is listening whether it is live today or listening to this as a recording, um, we are interested in learning more about what you right. uh, people living with these diseases, especially in times now. We got to remember we need more e health, and mm -hmm. you know if it's if it is an app. Um, what are you using that you find beneficial? Why is it beneficial? And what will make you want to continue using it? Because I think one of the number one issues is adherence to apps. Mm -hmm. It's just a, we, we download them, we have good intention, and then, you know, we don't. But as Aurelie's panel mentioned at ULAR, there's the, the apps for rheumatology are slim. <laughs> yes. So, you know, we want to make far sure between. Yeah. Yeah, we want to make sure the ones that are available to us are ones that we want to use because not only will it benefit us, but it's going to help uh, the the researchers as well, who you know obviously are, are learning from from these two. Um, I'm going to ask if there's anything else that Orly you would like to touch on here. Um, I've been doing a lot of of talking and questions. So I want to throw it back to you um, and, and, and ask you, especially as we move into this time of, of COVID and how do you see e-health evolving? Um, is there anything that you're specifically working on in relation to this? Well, so I would like to start with emphasizing what Dave was actually saying. I think it's really important. And in the, the thing that actually um, surprised me is that what you said was exactly the same things that came out the focus group that we've done on, uh, you know, um, smartphone apps use. So I mean, sure. it's, very, it's very interesting because that means that across the world, <laughs> uh, you know, everybody thinks. Yeah. The same. So yeah, I mean that that's really good, um, and yeah, that's the the real thing is that. If it's not easy to use, no one will use them. And also, if you, I mean, it's the same for everything. Like if I were to have an app and I used it for a few days and I don't see any outcome, nothing coming out of it. I don't see any benefit for myself, not even my health, but I mean, you know, for myself in general, yeah. I would just drop it. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we need to make sure that whatever is out there, available is actually has a purpose if it doesn't have a purpose it's not going to be used or not for a long time so yeah anyway just to 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 you know emphasize that it was very good to hear good. um yeah and now related to covid time what i do think is that um i think that there will be sort of emergency you know, e-health developments that will occur in the next, you know, weeks, months, yeah. uh, probably. Um, and this will somehow force the field to move very fast. Um, and this could be somehow a good thing in the sense that probably that the developments that we will see coming, if they're done, I mean, it can be an opportunity of developing things that can be further used and, you know, just reduce, um, you know, maybe not make people come to the hospital so often, uh, maybe, you know, virtual, um, uh, you know, appointments will be developed and, and made available and it will be good for everyone because that means you don't have to go to the hospital to be seen, you can be seen remotely, etc. But mm -hmm. the you know the challenge here is also that because we are we are in such in, an emergency situation, um, we need to make sure that we still do it in a safe manner, 
and you know in a, in a, um, in in something that can be sustained um, over months. So I think it's an opportunity, but there are lots of challenges also out there, especially in terms of um, safety of the data, because there's no lots of framework in place at the moment, not, not lots of regulatory frameworks. So I think that's the biggest challenge that we are facing. Um, you know, that, the, the, uh, the safety of the data and, and that kind of things, I think that can be, yeah. Or Lee, one thing um, that I've noticed um, is we have the electronic portals where um, it's a my chart. That's what mine is called. And in the recent times, um, there has been you can do video um, chats now that are urgent care. They have you can request those type of appointments now, and um, with asking a question of a healthcare provider, you can actually provide photos now within portals. Again, my son has developed two styes in his eye during this time, so um, just asking for you know reference and taking photos of it and sending it through. Um, I've also I've had an abscess, and um, I was following with my primary care physician with photos and they're not pretty photos, but um, they get the point. And I actually did end up having to go in because they're, they're like, okay, that's not looking good right now. We need to see if we need to lance and pack it. And you know, that was the last thing I wanted to hear, but again, versus going in the first, you know, at first, um, it's, it's definitely moving fast. Cause I, I, I noticed the portal is changing yeah. weekly, weekly. Yeah. 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 And, and that's why I really wanted this opportunity in addition to clarifying or, or making it, uh, known to our community, why it's so important for our mm -hmm. staff or the people with, um, AI arthritis to be attending these conferences, but because everybody, regardless if you're a person living with AI arthritis diseases or not, we're all in this time. And yeah. it was just really interesting that just, just a year ago, not, you know, we yeah. were, we were literally uh, like almost to the day <laughs> a year ago, mm -hmm. we were talking about this as an evolutionary, um, uh, process that we were working towards and now mm -hmm. we're thrust into it and and what what that means and and really what people want from it as it's starting um, to evolve so in, in saying that I do want to also just pose the question again for those who are living with our diseases um, what existing apps um, have been ones that you have gravitated towards and why because we really want to understand now that e-health is here and we need mm -hmm. to use as many of these methods of data collection and, and helping to increase quality of care as possible. We need to know what the barriers and the benefits are to ones that are existing, but also interested in knowing now that we have this new time, this new unprecedented, as everybody says, um, era that, that has fallen upon us, knowing what you know now and what you're experiencing, what would you like to see developed? What would benefit you? Now we're having different experiences and different barriers that we never thought would be an issue. Um, like Deb said, I mean, we have to take pictures now. We have to make sure that that there's visible, like, or at least said you can't do the palpitations. You can't physically touch. So there are new things that we're identifying that there is a need. And so what is that need? And, and as researchers and doctors and ACR and everybody are developing these protocols and these, these methods of engagement, let's have our voices heard. You know, we, we need yeah. to be at the table and we need to make sure because what will happen if we don't is that these will be developed and we're just going right back to saying, well, you missed this because this isn't what's important to me. And, and as Deb said, if, it, if the app or the application is not something that a patient is going to find benefit from, they're not going to use it. Yep. So then that's just a waste of time and money. So we definitely want to invite people to the table for, for that. Um, but I mean, thank you, Orly, for, for talking about all of this mm -hmm. with us. I mean, obviously the conversation is, is, is ongoing <laughs> and we're yeah. going, we'll, we'll check back with you. Um, one things that we found out about this um, and also, <clears throat> excuse me, and also, you know, just, just 
kind of exchange ideas and thoughts as the, the e-health is, is developing. But I wanted to just shift gears. You like how I did that, the auto thing. Yeah. Shift gears um, and just briefly also give everyone an update on a different mm-hmm. project that we are we are working on. So Orly, um, I I actually met Orly for the first time at Omeract, which is Outcome Measures in Rheumatology, and that is um, where doctors, researchers, and patients, and um, some pharmaceutical companies, that all different stakeholders come together. Uh, in these working groups that are very long-term. So this isn't like one little project over a month. These are years of working on um, on outcome measures that will improve uh, room- rheumatology. And one of the working groups that Orly is part of um, is a synovial tissue group, which I'm going to ask Orly if you could just give us a little background on the work that that group is doing, what it is that I'm referencing here. Yes, absolutely. So um, as some of you might know, synovial tissue is the membrane that is inside of the joint and that is usually targeted in um, rheumatic diseases, uh, especially in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, So the the work that the group has been doing for the, the, the past years has been first to better identify what were the actual uh, features of um, the tissue in different disease phenotypes and also how this could uh, maybe affect the diagnosis but also how this could affect the way we um, define the prognosis Mm -hmm. especially in rheumatoid arthritis in terms of of, uh, structural damage erosive phenotypes Um, And more recently, we moved actually towards a new era of personalized therapy, where um, the idea would really be to use the tissue to analyze, to be able to predict and to uh, give to the right patient the right drug at the right time. Mm -hmm. So this is the work we've been doing, mostly. Yes, and I was one of the patients who was able to listen to the team as they were presenting uh, the information and uh, how the process works. And as a as a person living with the disease, as at Omerac, they want your opinion as an equal. They they in order to develop outcomes that are beneficial to those who are participating now or who would be participating in these types of trials. Now, what was interesting about this project in particular is that in this clinical setting in in this trial to test the synovial tissue, unlike a situation where a patient like Deb, for example, who has had a biopsy, which is how they mm-hmm. they get the the inf- how they get tissue. it. That's what we said yes. last time we did it. We said you get it. That was our scientific term to yes. get the tissue. Um, it is that it's not something that the patient has to endure in order uh, to like in- improve their health or find out if something's going on. This would be a voluntary uh, procedure, procedure in order right. to advanced research. And that's where we needed, where kind of the aha moment came or the light bulb when I was listening to this and said, well, if we're going to have people volunteer, we need to know from these patients, first of all, anyone who's had this procedure or a similar procedure, what did, what was their experience? So how long did it take them to recover? So, cause it might be different than somebody who doesn't have our diseases, who isn't prone to inflammation or, or flares afterwards. So the hearing from the people who have gone through it and hearing from people who haven't and have questions that we could then answer mm-hmm. before they would go. So, so that's where this came in. So I brought Deb into this project because mm-hmm. I didn't, I've never had a biopsy. And I thought, well, this is a good team because I'm the, I'm the audience who hasn't. And Deb is the audience who has. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, and so we have been working with orally under um, AI arthritis under our organization over the last uh, probably few months to a year, um, mm-hmm. trying to put together some 
questions, some focus group um, surveys, that type of thing, so that we can get more feedback from you, from the person, the people living with these diseases. Um, and, and also the ones that um, haven't or have not had the biopsy. Right, like myself. If they, right. Would they would they consent to have the biopsy done with knowing certain factors about it, you know, right. um, as far as and, that goes. And that, so that, and then, and, and then what we will do is, is that information will be used to help Orly and Orly, could you just explain a little bit of, of, as you said before, patients who wanted with the app, they wanted to know what was doing done with the data. So will you tell us a little bit about, about that being participant, if you were participating, what you're using with that information? Yes, definitely. So um, um, what I can tell uh, by being the co-chair of the ULAR Synovitis study group and by having seen lots of uh, studies and going um, is that definitely this is a promising approach. Uh, but the thing really that uh, we want to figure with this work is what, because obviously the tech, there are different techniques that can mm -hmm. be used and this, this depends on the centers. Um, there are different settings for using it. Uh, for example, back in France, I was doing mostly for clinical purposes. So it varies. Sometimes it's for research purposes, but what we really want to make sure is first of all, uh, by asking patients who had it, um, what they would really have liked to know before they had it, um, mm -hmm. you know, and patients who, didn't have it, but might be involved in some trials that require synovial biopsy, is to know uh, what would they like to know before they have it. What would, you know, if they would, you know, just consider having it. What and 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 how we can make sure we get the 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 best information to them, also in terms of how we can use it, because basically, and what would be the outcome. Because mm -hmm. the outcome will not be beneficial for them at the time of the actual biopsy. The outcome right. would be beneficial overall mm -hmm. for a group of patients and probably not now. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing that really needs to be explained and emphasized. But um, what I can tell is definitely that we do lots of fancy analysis on the tissue um, from cells to very fancy genes analysis and there's been some promising results so far but yeah i don't know if that answers the question no it absolutely i okay. thought that was i Fabulous. thought that was completely clear as, yes. as can be and and so we do have a full episode that we did on this project it's called um changing the world with your knee and uh because like orally said the difference between this project and something like what we're asking about the apps which would be um, if what would you like developed that you might use that could be beneficial for your personal journey or outcome because that's what we've realized why most patients will use an app. This is a little different mm -hmm. because we're asking um, not for what could benefit your immediate outcome. If you participated in a trial that has the, the, synov the synovial tissue taken by a biopsy, your, the outcome that's beneficial is really for the greater good of everyone else coming after you. So you're, you're sort of, um, helping millions in the future lead the way as, as they're helping, as they're developing treatments for precision medicine, for being able to, like Aurelie said, um, treat people early on at the right time with the right medicine. So you're, you're being right, a pioneer, so to speak. So, so the, the benefit is you're doing this to help others. And so that, that's something to realize. So we're going to post a link to that full episode so you can learn a little bit more in detail about the project. But I also, on that link, there is uh, there's a, a button that you can click if you are a person living with these diseases. You do not need to have rheumatoid arthritis. It can be any of our um, autoimmune or auto-inflammatory diseases. Uh, but that have arthritis is a, is a major clinical component, does have to have the arthritic component. 
Um, and you can sign up to talk with Deb and myself. And we're going to be leading some focus groups. We have already started uh, with some preliminary discussions. So you can just click that button and sign up and we'll be in contact with you shortly and we'll help orally and you could you can have your voice as part of this project. So I, I think that's kind of an exciting opportunity. It is. It's, I mean, it leads right down to the path of precision medicine. And that's exactly, I mean, for anybody who's had, I've had it for 37 years. And if, you know, there's anything I can do to help lead, lead that way towards that kind of precision medicine of knowing which medication is going to work better for that particular patient. Um, again, it's for individualized, you know, attention. I, I, I think it's amazing. And um, if I were in that position, again, in the United States, my reason of having the biopsy was more for a clinical purpose here in the United States. Um, but to have that opportunity and know that that technology is out there and the researchers are looking for that, it's, it is, you know, groundbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. And as um, a, a pillar of our organization and mm -hmm. what we what we do in our in our focus areas, precision medicine is right there at the top. We've been we've had this on our radar for many years, and we've been told um, by several uh, um, companies up to like two years ago that wow, you all AI arthritis is really one of the leaders in mm -hmm. regards to paying attention to this and being involved. And we we have a um, preparing patients for precision medicine project that was an award finalist, uh, gosh, in 2018. So that shows you it has been a couple years. So we developed mm -hmm. that in 2017 and then won the award in, in 2018. So that's how long we've had um, our, our feet in, in this, uh, because we know how important it is. So we'll make sure that we link you to that project as well, because we are also, also recruiting for patients for that precision medicine project and other stakeholders, hint, hint, orally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's just no, but we are uh, other stakeholders so that um, they can they can have input as well as where we're we're, in. we're, mm -hmm. we're developing and and again we'll we're actually going to talk in detail about that precision medicine project in just a couple hours. We're meeting with um, Carrie Beach from Rheumatology Nurses Society who is is on that project with us, so that we'll feature it. If you want to come back and learn more, but other than that, I think um, our conversation I think has been fantastic. And I'm really excited, and, and I really want to thank both you, um, you Arlie, and you, Deb, for, for joining us at the table. This has um, been really wonderful. And for everyone out there listening, we want to just remind you again that this is a feature live presentation of AI Arthritis Voices 360, which is our official talk show for International Foundation for Autoimmune Autoinflammatory Arthritis, or AI Arthritis for short. And we are doing these live presentations because we had an auto ball scheduled, which was our very first gala ever <laughs> that we were supposed to have in St. Louis, Missouri, early May, to introduce our organization to a larger pool of people so we could in turn help more people and also to raise funds to carry us through to 2020. 2021. So we are asking if you, um, if it, we appreciate everyone who has given us support over the years and we are asking for it again. So um, we did lose all of our sponsors, unfortunately, when we didn't have the event. So um, any donations are welcome. And we have posted that link uh, to uh, donate. Any amount is, is appreciated. And we really hope that we can, we can gain your support. Also, you can go to AIarthritis.org backslash autoball, and there you can click to register for this autoball. Even though we've had the live, a lot of lives already, and we still will do this through tomorrow, if you register, we will send you links to them all. So mm -hmm. even if you couldn't be here live, you still get all of the content and it's free to register. So why wouldn't you, right? <laughs> Yes, exactly. So, so that's just, so we want to make sure that, that everyone registers as well so that we can follow up and, and give you all of this information that, that we've been sharing and tell you a little bit more about what we do and how you can get involved. So thank you again. 
everyone out there who's joining us, Lee, Deb, it's been a pleasure to have you at the table. And to all of you who are listening, please pull up a chair, join us, because only together can we change the stories of tomorrow. Your voice matters. So we hope to talk with you soon. Thanks, everybody. And come back in a couple hours where we talk to uh, Carrie from Rheumatology Nurses Society. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot.